right, well, we're going to jump right in. Uh, Mark is the second book of the New Testament, and it's also second among what we call the Gospels. Now, the word gospel is a translation of a compound Greek word. Um, the, the compound word means good news. The two words are the Greek word for good and the word angel or angelos, um, which literally means messenger. And so it's the good news or the good message. And the idea is it's, a, it's the good message that is to be delivered. And so this word gospel is used two ways uh, as it relates to the Bible. Number one, it's used of the message of salvation. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, Paul sort of uh, shrunk down the whole gospel message into a very, a very simple statement. He said, he said that the gospel was that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, he was buried, and he rose again. Okay, so, so Paul took the whole message of the Bible and he, he shrunk it down into this simple statement. Hey, what's the gospel? Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and he rose again. In writing to the Romans, Paul then talked about our responsibility. He says, for the gospel to have an effect upon our lives, Paul said that we have to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and we have to believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. Because he, because he said it's, it's with the heart that belief happens. It's not just an acknowledgement of a truth, but, but that, that heart belief, which we might uh, say is a, is a trust or a reliance. And then he said it's with the mouth that confession is made. Jesus, and you're here in Mark's gospel, I hope, chapter one, Jesus added a, another element to our responsibility. If you take a look at verse 15 of Mark chapter one, we read, Jesus said that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What did he say to do? Repent, Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe. Now, the word repentance carries two ideas. Number one, it carries the idea of a changing of your thinking. Okay, so the thinking has to change. And the way it works, as this says, is we think something's okay. We think something is fun or good or positive or something that's gonna make us better and we think that we should do this. And then we come across the word of God. We come to encounter what God has to say and we, we come to realize that what we thought was okay, God says is not okay, right? And so we have to, I have to change my thinking. I have to go, oh, well, I, I, thought, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. I, I thought that was something I was supposed to do. I'm not supposed to do that. So my thinking changes. Now, my thinking is not the only thing that changes for me to repent. I have to not only think differently, but then I have to act differently. So repentance carries the idea of changing the mind, and then when my mind changes, my actions follow. I stop doing the thing that I was doing before, or I start doing the thing that I was failing to do before. Okay, so that's what repentance is. Now, just as there are sort of two aspects to repentance, there are two aspects to the, the changing of behavior, the turning part of repentance. And the first of, of it is, is turning from what I'm doing wrong. So if I'm involved in something I shouldn't be doing, to repent means I get my hands off that and I turn away from that. The second part of that is that I'm turning to the Lord. I'm turning to God. Now here's what often happens to us. We have the realization that what we're doing is not acceptable to the Lord and our, our thinking changes. But then we struggle for our actions to change, right? And then we just feel super guilty every time we keep doing the thing that we're not supposed to be doing. And we just feel guilty but we, we lack the strength to do it. And sometimes the reason we lack the strength to do it is because we are focusing on turning away from what we're doing rather than focusing on turning to the Lord. And as I turn to the Lord, there's an interesting verse, it's in the book of Acts, we'll get there. And in the book of Acts it says this, that God granted them repentance. Repentance was granted and here's the idea. The, the idea is that God is giving the enabling for us to be able to turn from the thing that he wants us to turn from. And so if you're at that point now where you're like, well, 
I know that I'm not supposed to be doing this, but I still struggle to do it. I'm having problems going from what I know to be wrong to behaving correctly is uh, the focus then needs to be just turning to the Lord, turning to him. So the gospel, Jesus died for our sins, was buried, rose again from the dead, all according to scripture. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're saved. Now once you've believed, now you need to repent. Change your thinking about what you used to do. Start thinking the way God wants you to think, turning to him for the strength to then work it out, the gospel. Now, there's a second way that the word gospel is used. The word gospel is also used to speak of the first four books of the New Testament. They are commonly referred to as the Gospels. And it's because they contain the message of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so they're called the good news. That's what, that's what they're called, they're the good news about Jesus Christ. They're explaining to us who he is. They include both the claims of Christ and they include the actions that prove his claims, okay? L let me list to you just a few of the claims of Christ that we'll encounter in the Gospel of Mark. He claims that the kingdom of God is now at hand. We just read that verse, 115, the kingdom of God. Now, the idea behind the kingdom of God is it's this long awaited for promise to where God is going to uh, have impact upon the life of the world. The full, fullest fulfillment of the kingdom of God will happen as we've come to the end in, on our weekend studies of the book of Revelation when Jesus comes back, the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. But prior to that, the kingdom of God is experienced by the individual when they encounter Jesus Christ. And he becomes Lord or king of their life and their world is completely transformed. And as we read through the gospel accounts, we see every person that encounters Jesus and trusts him, their life has changed. Things happen to them. In chapter eight, Jesus promised that true life is found when we surrender to him. That if we want to experience real life, it's going to be in surrendering, bowing that knee to Jesus Christ. In chapter 9, Jesus promised that it's better, or he claimed, that it's better to get sin out of your life, even if it means you have to take some pretty radical um, steps to get rid of it. He said, if your hand causes you to sin, what do you do? Your foot? Your eye? Now, is he being literal? No, okay? Here's how we know that. Can you sin one-handed? One-footed and one-eyed? Absolutely, <laughs> okay? You, I can tell you, I went months one-footed. My wife can tell you I had no problem sinning, okay? So he's, he's not speaking literally. He's saying that there are radical steps that need to be taken to get sin out of our life because, listen, life is better when sin's removed. That's a claim of Jesus, Jesus also claimed in chapter 12 that we, are to, that we must love God supremely. That God must be the chief love of our life. The number one passion and ambition of our life should be to live pleasing to Jesus Christ, to love him. That was his claim. He also claimed that he was the son of God and the savior of humanity and the king of kings. He made those claims. All of those are recorded in Mark's gospel with, a, with a, a whole lot more. Now listen, those claims are presented in the gospels, but then we also read about the actions of Jesus that back up the claims, right? Anybody can claim anything. I mean, that's basic marketing, right? Marketing, you learn how to claim stuff that you're not really gonna back up with facts. Okay, I'm gonna look over here in case there's any marketers on the left side of the room, but the... The, the idea is Jesus not only makes the claims, but Mark presents the facts that support the claims that Jesus made. And keep in mind that people, when Mark wrote this, there were people still alive that had encountered Jesus that could verify the claims that Mark made about Christ and about his accomplishments. Um, if you're, you're here in Mark, look at chapter two, 
at uh, verse 10. Chapter 2 at verse 10. Jesus said that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately he arose and took up his bed and went out in the presence of them all so that they were amazed and glorified God and said, we never saw anything like this. Okay, so here we have Jesus makes the claim, your sins are forgiven. Then he says, but so you know that my claim is, is valid. He looks at the guy, he says, stand up and walk. And a paralyzed guy stands up, picks up his Mac and goes home and everyone said, what in the world just happened? Okay, his claim was verified by his action. Now, Mark, um, one of the four gospels is actually the shortest of the four. It contains 16 chapters and 678 verses. Um, part of the reason for the, the brevity of Mark is the, the sheer fact that he leaves out any reference to the, the birth or childhood of Jesus. Um, he's, he spends in just a couple of verses introducing Jesus to us. He introduces the, the ministry of John the Baptist but gives us no background of John the Baptist. He just jumps right in to explaining uh, the, the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. As, as a result, I've entitled this book, Jesus in Action, because he gets started right away. I had a professor in college, and, and uh, he, he drove a Porsche. And I remember one time just chatting with him afterwards, after class, and, and I said, you know, why do you drive a Porsche? I and mean, we live, lived in Southern California. You, you know, you, it's like you might have these great fantasies of driving fast, but there's always more traffic that, than you can ever drive fast with. And, and uh, I said, you know, why, what's, you know, what's the deal? Why the attraction? He says, well, I don't necessarily want to speed. I just want to get to the speed limit faster. <laughs> it's like, all right. So if he and I are sitting at the light and I'm there in my Honda Element, and he goes, oh, Okay, because that's a different sound between an element and a Porsche. But the, you know, Mark's like that. It's like a Porsche, man. He's, he's, he's getting straight to the point. He's, he's jumping in high speed. He's right away, you know, kicking it into overdrive. And, and we are following him right away into the action of Jesus. In fact, here in uh, chapter 1, we read in chapter 1 alone, we read of the calling of Peter, Andrew, James, and John healing of the sick, casting out of demons, cleansing of lepers, as well as give an insight into the devotional life of Jesus. All just, that's just chapter one, okay? One of the interesting things to do is, is you go through the, the Gospel of Mark is just look at the verbs that Mark uses to describe the action of Jesus and that he's teaching and he's healing and he's entering and he's walking and he's casting and he's claiming and, and he's just one thing after another, Jesus active in the life. And all of this, um, the majority of the action of Jesus fits into the realm of what we might call just the miraculous. And there are at least um, 18 different miracles recorded by mark that Jesus accomplished, okay? And I'm not gonna list, go through the list here. They'll be in the notes that'll be up on the website in a couple of days, so you can, you can go look at, at each one of those in detail from that. But, but it's just one miraculous thing after another. And these miracles demonstrate the power that Jesus has. His power over disease, over nature, over the spiritual and material world, and even over death. Jesus and his power are evident in the Gospel of Mark, which is interesting when you keep in mind that each of the Gospel writers had an audience, and, and they also seem to have a theme. And uh, it, it's, it's the, um, it seems evident that the audience that Mark was writing to was, was the Roman world, and the theme was that Jesus is a servant. He's constantly at motion, constantly working, constantly serving. And yet, he's serving with ultimate power. He's the, he's the servant, but he's the servant king with ultimate power over everything um, in complete authority. And these miracles that he does prove beyond doubt that he is 
the Messiah sent from heaven to save mankind. In fact, it was the, the miracle or the miraculous work of Jesus that led Nicodemus to come to Jesus and, and to ask Jesus about who he was and, and the way to heaven. That's recorded in John's gospel. Note the screen, John chapter three. A man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Next verse reads this. This man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know that you're a teacher come from God. Listen, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with them. And so here's this guy, this religious leader, student of the scriptures. And when he sees the things that Jesus is doing, he's drawn to him. He knows those actions prove that Jesus is otherworldly. And that was the purpose of his miracles. Now, um, the miracles that Mark records, they're more than just fascinating stories. Okay, they are fascinating. Some of the greatest stories you'll ever read in your life are, are recorded in the Gospels. And Jesus was such an incredible storyteller and he would captivate people's attention with his actions and with his words. But it's more than fascinating stories. These things are designed to capture our attention and they're all used as evidence to prove that Jesus is who he claimed to be. That's the purpose behind the miracles. Um, in the book, you'll take a look at it at the beginning, it says the gospel according to Mark. Um, Mark didn't write that. He didn't write the gospel according to Mark and then begin. Mark began with in the beginning the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, the, the book itself has no, no author that is listed in it. But the uh, early church is unanimous in giving credit to Mark. In fact, uh, in the early part of the second century, copies of this book already had the addition, the gospel according to Mark. And so it's, it's been recognized that this was written by Mark. It's also recognized, going back to the early part of the second century, it was recognized that Mark received his information from Peter. Okay, he's not one of the 12 apostles. He was a young man, we'll talk a little bit more about him in just a moment, but he was befriended by Peter and received his information from Peter and wrote this account. Now, one of the, one of the ways that, that the validity of that statement um, or that, that idea uh, or th is validated is this. Um, first of all, it's accepted as far back as, as we have evidence. Um, and secondly, is if you were putting your name on a gospel account to try to get some sort of credit, you wouldn't choose some unknown character named Mark, right? <laughs> I mean, you'd want to put a lot of the, a lot of the, 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 um, a lot of writings around that, or uh, centuries later, they tried to, um, there's a word I'm looking for and I can't find, counterfeit, that's the word I'm looking for. Counterfeit writings, somebody tried to lump in with genuine writings and they would always choose an apostle's name. So it's like you got the gospel according to Thomas because Thomas was a, a, one of the apostles and you're getting some credit there. Mark gives you no credit, right? It's like going into to some place and throwing my name around. It's not gonna help you, okay? You want a good seat at the restaurant, you know, you probably don't wanna throw my name around. It's not gonna help. My dad, my dad was a, a, a doctor of psychology. Uh, he, was, he ran the psychology department at one of the state universities in Southern California, and he never went by doctor. He always went by his name, uh, except when he wanted a table at a restaurant. Uh, it's a true story. I mean, he never, you know, with Dr. Gallagher, none of that except when he made a reservation for a restaurant, he would always put it under Dr. Gallagher because <laughs> he figured that was gonna give him better treatment and that 10 years of school, he at least earned that. So, um, this character, Mark, um, we, we find him a few times in scripture. Uh, in, uh, we're told in Acts chapter 12 um, that his mother's name was Mary and that she was, her house was actually used as a church house. 
And so those of you that, that have a home fellowship uh, in your home, uh, you're following the example of Mark's mom who opened up her home for the church to meet in. Um, we're also told of this character, Mark, that he was, he was one of the individuals that went out on the very first mission trip that Paul went on. Remember Barnabas and Paul traveled from the church in Antioch of Syria and they began to take the gospel and they, and they took it up to, uh, to the Galatian area. Um, and which is modern Turkey, and they, uh, they brought the gospel, and, and Mark, this young man, traveled with them. The problem was that things became more difficult than Mark expected, and uh, like a typical teenager, he didn't like to work hard, and so he quit, and he left. And so when it came time for the second missionary journey, and Barnabas said, hey, let's, let's grab Mark and bring him, uh, Paul said, Mark is not coming, uh, I don't have time to babysit. We've got ministry to do. And so Barnabas and, and, and Paul actually uh, divided ways at that point. Uh, they split. Barnabas took Mark, went to the island of Cyprus, and continued ministry and ministered to Mark. And Paul went on with his journeys, and the, go- and the book of Acts follows Paul's journeys. When we come to the end of Paul's life, the last letter that he wrote is 2 Timothy. And in 2 Timothy, he wrote and gave instruction concerning Mark. It's on the screen. This is 2 Timothy 4. And he writes, Paul writing, Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. And so certainly Mark grew out of that initial time of being unwilling to carry on in the work. He grew through that. He grew much through the ministry of Barnabas and was able to carry on in the Lord. And so his, his life, his life story, I think is really encouraging for anyone who has started out to serve the Lord and then got sidetracked, that God's not done with you. He still wants to do a work in your life and he can still restore you and do great things. You know, here's the Apostle Paul saying, man, I'm, this is it for me, I know I'm going, but Mark is useful. There's value in that guy, there's value in what he's done for me and what he's done for the kingdom. That being said, I um, want to give you a, a simple outline for Mark's gospel. Again, I mentioned how Mark goes so rapidly. He just from, you know, from one story to the next, to the next, to the next. And so it's very difficult to kind of outline the book um, because he's just moving. Uh, but there are, there are, there's one division that might help you in your reading. Chapters 1 through 10 cover the first three and a half years of Jesus' life. Okay, so chapter one through 10, the first three and a half years of his life essentially, or of his ministry. Starting with chapter 11 and going through chapter 16, cover the last week of his life. So more than, uh, more than a third of the book is devoted to seven, or actually 10, the seven final days of his life, um, No, let me see, eight days. So a total of eight days from Sunday to Sunday. Um, And so that eight-day period of time is covered in from chapters 11 through the end of chapter 16. And so, so much information. And really, um, all of the gospel accounts are like that. Most of the the ink is given to the final week of Jesus' life. Now, uh, why should we study the gospel of Mark? Why take the time to dig into it? Um, First of all, its rapid pace um, is a valuable way to introduce Jesus to new believers. Um, I think it's a, if, if you have recently come to the Lord or come back to the Lord, or you just feel a little bit like you're behind the eight ball, like you feel like, man, I'm in these conversations and everybody seems to know more than I know, read Mark, okay? Get to know Jesus in Mark. It's very rapid, and, and you'll be introduced to him. There are not, um, with, with the exception of the, uh, the Olivet Discourse that's in chapter 13, um, the, the, there are no long sermons that Jesus gives. It's action, one thing after another, and it gives us a real great backdrop to understand who he is. In fact, it's believed by many that the original purpose of Mark's gospel was, was to introduce new believers to Jesus. Uh, many believe that it was written by Mark from the instruction he received from Peter to the church in Rome, the new believers in Rome, to instruct them on how to grow in the Lord. And uh, 
Second reason to study this book is I think Mark really helps us to obey the exhortation found in Hebrews chapter 12. And so if you'll note the screen, this is Hebrews 12 at verse two. It says this, looking unto who? Jesus. Jesus. Look at Jesus, okay? That's some good advice, okay? I think that's, that might be the best advice in the whole Bible, okay? Look at Jesus. That word look is a word that means to turn your eyes away from other things and fix your eyes upon Jesus, okay? So it's, I have to turn my eyes away from other stuff in order to fix my eyes upon Jesus, and, and that's a necessary thing, isn't it? If you're looking one way and I want you to see something else, you've gotta turn from what you're looking at to look at what you need to see, okay? And the idea is, is the exhortation is, listen, we need, as believers, we need to be looking to Jesus. And sometimes it's as simple as turning my eyes away from other stuff. Sometimes it's as, it's as simple as going right? Sometimes it's as easy as, as you know, turning off Facebook, okay? Or, or, you know, just sitting down with your Bible and taking a look. Now, the exhortation is to look at Jesus. And the Gospel of Mark is filled with valuable lessons for the, for the Christian on both how to live for Christ and how to serve Christ. And there's all these wonderful lessons here. And I'm gonna go through and just pick out a handful. And we're gonna just touch on them. Okay, so we'll see a, a little lesson in here, we'll see a little bit of application, and we'll move on rapidly through a number of these. There's a whole lot more that we won't touch on. The first one I want you to notice is found in chapter one, Mark's Gospel, verse 35. We read Mark 1, verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he, that's Jesus, went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Okay, now uh, this is a lesson on devotions, a lesson on having devotions. Jesus rose early, got away from distractions, and spent time with the Father. Now, if we want to have a spiritual development, if we wanna grow in our relationship with the Lord, we need to establish a devotional time. Jesus set the pattern for us. He got, a, he got up early, he got away from distraction, he spent time with the Lord. And I think that there are three important elements to having devotions. Number one, Bible reading. Okay, I think Bible reading is critical. You can't have devotions without it. I think the kind of Bible reading where you wake up and do this, what am I gonna read today, is not very effective. Okay, I think systematic Bible reading is effective. That's why we encourage you here to pick up one of the Bible reading cards and to join us and read at least a chapter of the New Testament a day and perhaps even a couple chapters of the Old Testament each day and read the word together. Secondly, um, Bible reading or, or devotions needs to include meditation. Now, the sort of modern use of the word meditation means to empty your mind of everything, right? So get everything out of your mind and empty your mind and think of nothing and now think of nothing, nothing. Then go deeper into nothing, okay? That is the exact opposite of the biblical use of the word meditation. The biblical word means to fill your mind, okay? So I'm reading a text, what is this text saying? What is it that I'm learning here? And then I take that and I begin to think about that. And then I, the third thing is that I need to pray for the appropriate application in my own living from what I've read. So I read a passage of scripture in the morning, I start thinking about the, the part, of what is it saying, what, 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 what is the, the uh, important truth for my life here, God, what do you want me to do, how do you want my behavior to change, how do you want me to function today because I read that? That's a successful devotion, okay? Jesus set the pattern for us. Second lesson I want you to see, chapter one, verse 45. Verse 45 we read, however, he, this is a leper that had been healed by Jesus, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter 
so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in a deserted place, and they came to him from every direction. Now, we can't really understand that without reading the verse before it that reads this way. Jesus said, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go to the priest and offer for your cleansing the thing commanded by Moses. Okay, here's a guy who had leprosy, an incurable disease, he's gonna die. He meets Jesus, Jesus heals him. And then Jesus gives him a command. And the command is, don't tell anybody. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Like, I mean, if, if, if you were to come to me and you were to say, Jim, can you keep a secret? I would say no. <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> empirical data proves that I can't keep a secret. Right? I mean, I can keep it for a little while. I can keep it from some people. But the fact of the matter is, if you're sharing something with me, it's probably going to come out at some point. Right? I mean, and, and, it, and the same thing's true of you. Right? So, the, the imagine this guy, I mean, the greatest thing in his life's ever happened to him, and then Jesus says, don't tell anybody. That doesn't make any sense, does it? It makes zero sense. I'd be going, okay, wait a minute. I had leprosy and I was gonna die and you just healed me. A, I don't think I can keep that in. And B, do you understand the press you could get out of this Jesus? I mean, do you, do you know what this could do for your following? We could, I mean, you, you will not have a financial problem any longer if you let me take care of you know, this, this program for you. You healed a leper. You see, it didn't make sense to the man. And because it didn't make sense, he went out and did something else. And I think therein lies a very important lesson about obedience. What Jesus tells us to do or not do doesn't have to make sense to us. We just have to do what Jesus tells us to do or not do, right? It, as, as things come, it starts to make sense. We read that he went out and he publicly made a big deal out of it, and so people came and they crowded around Jesus so much, not just because they wanted to hear the things that he had to say, but because they wanted to see a show, and it limited the effectiveness of his ministry. But this guy couldn't see that. All he could see was that it was a great marketing scheme. And I'm not picking on the marketers tonight particularly. Just, just happened to come out in two things. Hey, let's look at chapter two real quick. No marketers there. Verse 1 says, again, he, Jesus, entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. And they came to him, bringing him a paralytic, or a paralytic, who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was so that when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which he was lying. So the story goes on to say they laid him down, Jesus looked at him, forgave his sin, healed him, and sent him off. But I see here an important lesson on evangelism. Here, we've got a group of guys that knows where Jesus is gonna be, where, where preaching, in this case from Jesus, is gonna be taking place. And so they are determined to get their friend there. And when they face obstacles, like they can't get him in because there's too many people, or the door's locked, or the, the, the access to the door is blocked, that doesn't stop them, does it? These guys climb on the roof and tear somebody else's roof apart to lower their friend into the midst of Jesus. And I, and I think here we have a great illustration of, of what it is to bring someone to Christ. If you attempt to invite your friend, your neighbor, your coworker, whoever it is to Christ, you're gonna face opposition. But these guys are a great example for us of persistence in bringing someone to Christ. I think we can learn a lot from them. Also, you'll note that the, the man that they brought was, he was a forgotten individual. Nobody else brought him. None of the people that got there early brought him, right? He's a forgotten individual. And he was a man who thought he had one need and Jesus knew he had a greater need. Most people who, who have not come to Christ don't really know what their most important need is. They think it's something else. They think it's something physical. They think it's something financial. Jesus knows that their most important need is having their sins forgiven and, and being born again. 
And, and so this guy came, and he perhaps came because he heard about the healer. The guy can heal a leper. Maybe he can heal me. But when he came in contact with Jesus, Jesus dealt first with his sin, his relationship with them, before the fact that he couldn't walk. Let's look at a couple more of these. In, in chapter 3, at verse 13, we have a great lesson on being called to ministry. Chapter 3, 13, we read, And when Jesus went up on the mountain and called to him those he, himself, those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. And then the list of the twelve guys is given. And so we see here a couple of very important things. If we want to be used, if we want to be called by God for Christian service, we say, man, I want God to call my name. I want to be used by the Lord. I want to get opportunity. I want you to notice a couple of things. Number one, I want you to notice that those who were called to serve were those who had first become disciples, okay? When Jesus fishes for someone to use, he fishes in a pool of disciples, okay? Someone who is growing in relationship with Jesus Christ. That's who he's gonna call to use. Secondly, I want you to notice that uh, they were given everything necessary in order to do what God called them to do. It says that they were given power and that they were given it over unclean spirits and, and so forth. Let me, look, let me look at the verse. He says um, they were given power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Now, why were they given power to heal sicknesses? Well, because they were gonna run in contact with six people. And why power over unclean spirits? Well, because they were gonna come in contact with unclean spirits, right? So Jesus is always gonna give you power to do what he calls you to do, okay? And so these guys had to understand that, listen, the first thing I need to do is grow in the Lord, then as God calls me and I step out, he's gonna equip me to do whatever, I've called, whatever he's called me to do. Next thing I want you to see, uh, chapter five, verse 19. This is one of my favorite stories. It's the story of when Jesus and the disciples cross the sea and they're met there by that demon-possessed guy who's all naked and crazy, okay? And, and which in and of itself would have been quite moving on. But this, when Jesus sees him, Jesus casts the demons out of the man. And this man who had been completely crazy, he's clothed in his right, man, right mind. Jesus did a work in his life. And at the end of the story, in verse 18, we read, when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed, that's a much better description of him, begged that he might be with, with them, with Jesus and the guys. Verse 19, however, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them the great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis and all, all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Here we have a lesson on missions. Okay, this is the very first missionary from the church of Jesus Christ. Okay, the first church of Christ sent out their first missionary. The guy had been saved for a half a day. He'd been a, he'd been a, a crazy, naked, demon-possessed guy who met Jesus. Okay, and Jesus sent him out as a missionary. Okay, so what's your missionary training? Number one, meet Jesus. All the other qualifications that you have don't matter at all if you don't have that one. This guy met Jesus and his life was changed by him. And then the guy went out and what was the message? Did he, did he, did he have to go out with, with you know, a, a systematic theology on the jealousy of God? No, he's had to go out and tell people what Jesus did for him. I can imagine his stories. Hey, you, have you ever heard of that naked, crazy guy that used to live out in the tombs? They go, oh yeah, that guy's nuts. I used to take my family out there. We used to picnic. Beautiful area, Gadara, love it. But that naked guy ruined everything. <laughs> I can take my kids around there. Yeah, he goes, do you hear that guy got saved? No, yeah, true story. How do you know? I'm him, prove it. Here's the scars, right? I mean, this guy just talks about what Jesus did in his life and people are blown away by it. And he went to the Decapolis, Paulus is the Greek word for city. Deca means what? Ten. It's an area, the ten cities. This guy went through ten cities. Just telling people what Jesus did for him. 
first missionary of the church. Hey, you want to be involved in missions? Tell people what Jesus is doing in your life. Tell them how, tell them how, they're change, how Jesus is changing your life. Let's look at a couple more. We have time. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> Chapter 6, verse 38 tells us about the feeding of the 5,000. Verse 38 says, Jesus asked, how many loaves do you have? And they said, five, two fish. He commanded them to make them sit down in groups on the green grass, and they sat down in ranks of hundreds and fifties. He took out the loaves and the fish, looked up to heaven, blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples, and they set it before them, and all ate and were filled. Okay, and here we have a lesson in provision. Okay, a basic principle. Um, three things are involved. First of all, their limits didn't limit God. Five loaves and two fish. That was all they had. Okay, but their limits aren't going to limit God. Number two is that they had to offer what they did have. It was a, the five loaves and two fish was enough for a few people until it was given to the Lord. And when it was given to the Lord, it was enough for the, for the entire event. And then finally, Jesus is the one that provides what is lacking. Jesus showed up. And just a basic principle in provision. Because we all know that life is, is a lot of times about not having enough. And we need to learn to trust the Lord, whether, we're, whether it's just for life and managing life or whether it's for ministry. We've gotta to learn to trust the Lord. Um, there's more of these than we have time for, so I'm gonna pick, pick one more. Go to chapter nine. Chapter nine, because the one in chapter eight we'll see when we get to Luke. Hopefully I won't forget. Chapter nine, verse 23, great story. Verse 23, Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible for him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help what? My unbelief. <laughs> My unbelief. <laughs> okay, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Now, the... The Gospel of Mark, the other three Gospel writers, um, and, and many other texts throughout Scripture are designed to illustrate for us faith. But there's an interesting element of faith that's brought out by this guy's story. And that is that it is possible for faith and doubt to cohabitate, right? Faith and doubt can live together in the same mind. And that True faith is not the removal of doubt, okay? You're not exercising true faith when you've driven all doubt out. So, so you're spending all your time trying to shove doubt out, okay? Well, I believe, oh no, that was an unbelief thought. I gotta get that unbelief thought out of here. I gotta push this, I believe, I believe, I believe. And, and you're just always trying to get your unbelief thoughts out. Don't ever say anything, you know, how you feel? I'm feeling excellent, I'm feeling well. I'm feeling super good and well and strong because you don't wanna ever have any, like, that's a waste of your time and it's nonsense, okay? Here's the deal. Unbelief and belief can cohabitate in the same mind. Faith is choosing to act on belief rather than acting on doubt. That's what belief is, right? And, and you know, I think of in James, James talked about the, the double-minded man. Let, let not him that um, uh, doubts think that he's gonna get anything from God because he's a double-minded man and he's unstable in all his ways. James is not saying that if you have a thought of doubt in your mind that you're double-minded and you're never gonna accomplish anything. He's pointing out the, sh the sheer fact that the one who chooses to act on doubt rather than acting on faith is going to be unstable. And the person that chooses to act in faith rather than doubt is the one that's gonna see things accomplished. Everything that I've ever, that, that I would ever say has been done like, well, I trusted the Lord and God did this. Everything I've ever done, doubt has commingled with my faith. I've just chosen to say, well, <laughs> I'm just gonna trust the Lord because I don't really have any other choice. I'm either gonna trust the Lord or I'm gonna trust me and that has never worked out too well for me. Okay, so the idea here, this guy is saying, I believe there is this unbelief here. I'm choosing at this moment to trust you and your promise, Jesus, instead of my fears and doubts and everything that's mixed with it. Now, all that said, let's get to the last part of this. Um, 
Mark gives us a vivid picture of the, of the crucifixion of Christ. And uh, starting in chapter 11, as I mentioned before, um, we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. He's fulfilling uh, Old Testament prophecy by doing that. Uh, Daniel told us when it would happen. Zechariah told it. Zechariah told us how it would happen, that he'd ride in on a, on a donkey. And the psalmist told us the people's response, that they would sing Hosanna, blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then Jesus would spend the early part of that week, so Sunday he rides in, the early part of the week, he'd spend it in the temple precinct, he'd be teaching there, and he'd be dealing with the religious leaders who continue to try to trip him up. As the week moves forward, Jesus would gather together with his closest followers and they would have the Passover meal together and it was there that that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper he took the bread and he took the wine and they they had that together um, and he told us that we should then do that in remembrance of him um, it was at that meal that Judas then went out and uh, betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver which is the price of a slave in the Old Testament and then Jesus and the other disciples, the 11 others, they, they left and they walked up outside the city gate and then up onto the Mount of Olives. And there in a garden, uh, an olive tree garden, uh, Jesus went to prayer and the disciples went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, he's arrested. Uh, and when he's arrested, the disciples fled. And Jesus was then taken to the high priest's home and he was put on trial by the religious leaders and they condemned him uh, to death because he claimed to be the son of God and the savior of humanity. Then they brought him that next morning. Um, it was during that time while he was there before the religious leaders that Peter denied him his, his two times and um, the, uh, or denied him three times before the rooster crowed twice. And then um, they took him to the Roman Authorities, And the reason they took him to the Roman authorities is because they wanted Jesus put to death publicly. They, they, in the book of Acts, Stephen, Stephen's the first martyr of the church, and the, the, the religious leaders killed Stephen, and there was no re repercussions. The Roman authorities didn't do anything about it because they didn't care. And the religious leaders could have put Jesus to death quietly like they had done Stephen, um, they had the authority to do that. What they didn't have the authority to do is to put him to death publicly. And they wanted him to be put to death that way because they wanted to put an end to his followers as well. So they brought him to the Roman authorities. We know that Pilate attempted to um, have Jesus released by offering to them Barabbas. This is all in Mark. Um, offered Barabbas to them. The crowd cried out for Jesus' blood. And they took Jesus and they beat him and they nailed him, took him outside the city, nailed him to the cross, and there he bled and died. Now Mark only records for us one of the seven sayings that Jesus makes from the cross. It's in chapter 15, take a quick peek over there. Chapter 15, verse 34. And we read that Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you what? forsaken me. And this gives us some insight into the, 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 that which Jesus bore when he went on the cross. See, Jesus was paying for our sin. And because he was paying for it, he was taking the penalty for sin upon himself. And the penalty for sin is separation from God. And so Jesus is bearing that penalty. He's on the cross crying out, God, you've forsaken me. You've left me. Now it's interesting, the writer of Hebrews tells you and I that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've put your faith in Christ, you've been born again, the Spirit of God lives in you, Christ lives in you, you, you belong to Him, the writer of Hebrews tells us that He will never leave you or forsake you. And yet here's Jesus on the cross and the Father's forsaking Him because He bore the penalty for our sin. He, that was laid upon Him. We're told that then He breathed His last they took his body down from the cross, they took him and laid him in a tomb, and three days later, he conquered sin, death, and hell by rising from the dead, having victory over our sin. Now, Mark doesn't end with Jesus just risen from the dead. Mark ends with a final commission that Jesus gives to the church, and, and this one, coupled with Matthew 28, uh, is, uh, 
gives really the marching orders for the church, for us, the disciples of Jesus Christ, as we wait. And I want you to notice the screen. It's Mark 16, verse 15. And here's the commission that Jesus gives to us. Go into where? All the world. And do what? Preach Preach the gospel. To who? Okay, so that's not tough. Like, that's not difficult to understand. This isn't one of those, man, I wish I really could understand this verse. So complicated. Okay, go where? Well, all the world. That means everywhere, right? Okay, Does, is, is your place of business, is that included, do you think, in, in the whole world? Okay, your home, that might be included. Okay, the beach, that might even be part of the world, which I'm really happy for. Okay, and when you go there, what are you supposed to do? Preach. Now, preach means to stand up, yell real loud, and point your finger at people. Okay, that's not what the word preach means. The word preach means to herald, declare, proclaim, or publish. Okay, basically the idea is that we should seek to spread the gospel in whatever medium possible. Every way that we can possibly spread the gospel. Okay, so somebody comes up with some crazy new way to communicate in the social network and she uses to tell people about Jesus. It's like, oh look, Facebook, here's some Jesus. Okay, Insta Jesus, okay, what's that, Snap Jesus, whatever the things are, let's, let's just get the Lord out, the message of the gospel out there. Okay, but let me say this also, don't use that as an excuse not to have FaceTime with people. And I'm not talking about computer FaceTime, I'm talking about actual seeing someone's face, being in the same room with them, and talking to them about Jesus. Okay, sometimes I think people get their, their evangelism stuff off them by posting something on Facebook or reposting something. So Jesus' face shows up on it and it says, like if you're a Christian and you feel guilty if you don't like it, because, well, I'm a Christian and I love Jesus, if I don't like this, so you click that and then you get your evangelism out of you for the day. Okay, that doesn't fit that verse, okay? That's not what we're talking about. Tell people about Jesus Christ. Look for ways. Why? Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for anyone that believes.